As the title of this presentation suggests, um, we want to be, uh, I guess, provoking a little bit of thinking and maybe con contesting some of the ideas that are, uh, are out there about boarding schools. And uh, boarding is a pathway, in this case, to, to higher education, and particularly its implications for uh, Northern Territory institutions like Bachelor and CDU. Um, we might think that um, it's logical that giving people a, a good start in education is going to give them uh, a better chance of a pathway into higher education. And that boarding school, because it's so much better than what happens in remote schools, my tongue's in my cheek, uh, is, uh, is logically the best way to achieve that. So that's, that's where we will head with the presentation. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Larrakia country. It was, uh, uh, I too would, uh, it's a bit of a shame that Bill is not here now, because I'd love to thank her for uh, the welcome that she gave uh, earlier on. It was great. Um, and I always count it a real privilege to be here. I'm a visitor in this uh, country, uh, having come from down south several years ago. Uh, but it is such a, a sensational place. and. Um, uh, when you fly over the mangroves there on the way to what area or wherever you're going, um, it's just uh, absolutely amazing. I'd also want to acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues who've worked with me on the topic of boarding school education uh, over a few years now, uh, and Andrew's one of those. Um, and uh, the work that we're talking about this afternoon is a bit of a collective piece of work that involves academics and practitioners from around the country. So. Um, it's not just me that's uh, doing these things. But let's just have a, a bit of a think a little about remote education in the Northern Territory, just for starters. Uh, the little table on the right that you probably can't see there, it comes from my school, uh, which is publicly available, anyone can look at it. And they, uh, I've just grouped uh, very remote schools in the Northern Territory by what kind of school uh, was there in 2017. And so there's, a, there's a, quite a variety of different kinds of um, school year ranges that are available for remote students. Uh, some go from uh, transition to year 12. Others are only from uh, prep to six. Or so so there, there is a bit of variety there. And there are about 80 of these uh, very remote schools. Most of them are public schools with uh, nearly 10,000 students that are enrolled uh, and the vast majority of those are Aboriginal students um, and uh, so you're looking at around 90% of the, of the student cohort in very remote schools are Aboriginal students. However, of those uh, nearly 10,000 students, only there's about 2,500 that according to the official statistics don't have any access to year 12 education at all. Now I think that's probably underestimating the reality of the situation because some of the year 12 offerings uh, in remote schools are perhaps not what we would think would be a, a, um, a fair offering. And I guess that's one of the reasons why you might want to send kids away to boarding school because what is available isn't necessarily very good, which is a bit of a shame, uh, and sometimes there isn't anything available. But my estimates are that around 2,000 students in, the, in very remote territory, based on the census information at least, aren't attending. So most of them would be enrolled, but there's about 2,000, um, 2,200 there, based on the 2016 census that actually aren't attending. These are high school students. Um, so um, according to the census, um, and this is self-reported, of course, um, 2,180 students attended very remote schools at a senior, sorry, at a secondary uh, level. So that's from year seven right through to year 12. Most of those would be in the range of seven to nine. Um, around, depending on which, which quarter you look at, around 1,400, uh, between 1,350 and 1,450, um, students were receiving ab-study payments. Now, if you're receiving this um, ab-study payment, which is B, 
uh, it means that you're getting the school gets a payment um, for you to attend the boarding school. So that suggests that the, of those students who are receiving ab study, which would be the vast majority of very remote students, around 1,450 are going to a boarding school somewhere. Now, some of those boarding school students are going to schools within the Territory, about 700, and the rest are going into state. So, having considered that little bit of data and the fact that there are 2,000 odd students that are not attending school, 2,500 that don't have access to Year 12, um, that's, I guess, some of the background that's driving uh, boarding for Northern Territory students. Um, one of the drivers is a, is a policy driver and that, that arose out of the Indigenous Education Strategy. I'm sure that Andrew can sort of uh, fill us in more on that if you want to know. Uh, and the setting up of a transition support unit back in 2015. 15. Uh, but there are also other agendas that are driving uh, uh, a push for boarding in the Northern Territory. One is uh, obviously closing the gap. Another is the... Um, the the number of scholarship programs that have popped up, whether they be uh, IYLP or the Australian Indigenous, Indigenous Education Foundation uh, or any of a number of others that seem to say, well, look, here's a bucket of money and just take it and you can get the best education that you could possibly want at a boarding school, either mostly interstate. Um, so scholarship programs are important. Ab study is an important driver as well. The availability of ab study uh, makes a huge difference for, for students that are wanting to attend uh, a boarding school. But there are also community drivers as well, and particularly community expectations that uh, kids that go away will have a better chance of being able to navigate two worlds. And I use that, that, that phrase, two worlds, um, somewhat loosely because I realise that there are more than two worlds. There are, um, it's not just a question of the Aboriginal world and the Western worldview. There are several Western worldviews and there are several Aboriginal worldviews. So, but this is the phrase that many community people often use when they're talking to us about uh, their hopes for boarding, that they want their children to be competent and comfortable working in two worlds. Another driver that comes from families is the, the history of boarding. So if, uh, if parents or siblings had been, older siblings had been to a particular school, there's a fair chance that if it went well for them, or it was perceived to go well, that the younger ones will go to the same school. Um, and I think that's probably the case in the study site that you're doing to some extent. But there are also historical connections to particular boarding schools. So for example, um, the, the Lutheran system has a, a strong presence with the Urara College in Alice Springs, and that attracts other people who've had a historical connection to the Lutheran Church around that region in Central Australia. Um, but another, another driver that's uh, perhaps a more pragmatic uh, strategic policy one is the cost of providing secondary education in remote communities, um, and particularly a quality secondary education. And this is one of the points that the Wilson Review, which was commissioned by the NT government in 2013, brought out that, uh, and, and he, he used words around the feasibility or the practicability of actually providing a decent secondary education in remote communities. Um, and so the, that cost of providing a secondary education is one of those drivers. And of course, it's not always easy to find teachers who are, have got the right qualifications and who are, um, are, are very comfortable working in a, an Aboriginal community uh, who, who are available to teach in these communities. So there are recruitment issues, cost issues, uh, there, and there's a whole bunch of other drivers. All of this has led in recent years to an increase in the number of people who have gone to boarding schools. Uh, there was a review issued by the Department of Social S Services in 2017, which said that in the period from 2012 to 2016, more than, there was more than 40% more students attending boarding schools from remote communities. Now, the strategy to um, 
to get kids to go to boarding schools has therefore worked. Um, it's been very successful. So, and, and also we see that there are growing numbers of Aboriginal kids that are achieving their NTCET. Um, and uh, that's, I would think, encouraging to see. Um, and all the boarding facilities in the Northern Territory are at capacity. There's no room for more uh, young people to actually go into boarding schools within the Territory, which is why they're having to go interstate. Um, and, and so we're seeing this, uh, you know, the overflow of demand uh, means that, that people are having to go interstate for their boarding school education. So I'm going to hand over to, to Andrew now just briefly to talk about his little project which involves uh, a community in Central Australia and the Unity College at Murray Bridge. Thanks John. Look, um, I suppose my interest in this project came about from managing the transition support unit. One of our officers came to me one day and said she was out in community, this college turned up in the community and the community was actually welcoming the college when they came to visit the community. So they came to visit and the people were coming out and saying hello to them. So there was a sense of, um, there was already, I mean, there was a sense of a strong relationship there. Um, I mean, the other thing is that it, m my interest also came, how come all those, how come there's a significant number of kids from one community that are attending one college in South Australia? How can that be? And, and I suppose the history is that um, there was an independent, probably um, altruistic person who thought that kids a few years ago should actually have an education in the States. So she actually drove them down and introduced them to the college in South Australia, which is Unity College. And Unity College actually inherited these kids and that they had this thought, well, we, we'll take them on. So they, they stayed in sort of um, houses and such in the community and then went to the college and then the college is actually, the situation's evolved now where they've probably more in a, in a boarding situation where there's a girls boarding house and there's a boys boarding house but they're sort of, they, I think they've hired two local houses. Um, so that's a little bit of the background. Arionga is a community, or Uchu, which is the indigenous name for Arionga, is a community 230 kilometres west of Alice Springs. It's got a quite a small population, it's bilingual. Um, and it's got a very strong community um, uh, focus. Um, they, there was a previous Indigenous principal, local Indigenous principal at the school, um, who still works at the school but not as a principal. Um, there's also very strong community leadership. Leadership believe in education. They believe that their kids should go away to get a secondary education. So it's a whole cohort of kids going away. Now this is a bit different to what usually happens with boarding. Usually what happens is, you know, kid who sort of shines in the community will go to boarding, or two or three, but not a significant proportion of the community. Um, so, um, and interestingly, we don't usually get too many kids that finish year 12. And I think just to give you a bit of an idea, from a remote, you know, from remote communities across the southern part of the Territory, there may be a population of about 200 kids per year group. That's very rough. Um, but of those 200 kids per year group, um, if we look at the number of kids who'd finish year 12, I'd probably be able to count on, you know, count on two hands, which is a very sort of low percentage of year 12 completion. It would probably be one of the lowest in Australia and probably pretty close to some of the lowest year 12 or secondary completions in the world. So, um, so here we have a positive aberration. There's last year two kids finished year 12 and then this year they're expecting four kids to complete year 12 at this college. So, and I suppose that really, so my question is for my pending case study is why is this so? I don't know. I don't really know. I sort of guess, but, um, and I've just come up with those three questions. And the first one's about, you know, how do they communicate? How does the, how, how, do, how do the two diverse schools, the interstate boarding school and the local community school communicate? Um, and second one is, how do they learn from each other? And, and, and the third one is that whole both ways sort of paradigm, how do we keep kids culturally safe whilst 
having a Western opportunity in a boarding school? How can we do both? Is it possible? Um, will they feel compromised? Um, it's a few pertinent questions there. And, and so I just mentioned before about the community leaders being feeling very strong about education, but they want to keep their language, they want their kids to keep their language, they want their kids to keep their traditional culture, um, it's their Pitinjara uh, language and their culture. Um, they want to instill those things with their kids, but they also want them to have the Western education. Um, I just put a couple of points down the bottom there about um, some interesting sort of data that I'm just sort of noticing. The interstate college visits the community about eight times a year, which is very unusual for a boarding school. Usually, we might get once a year. So, and we're talking, even if it's a sort of a, what I call a high-end boarding school, you know, even a school that has got heaps of money and heaps of resource, we might get one visit a year. But this school does it eight times a year. So the beginning and the end of every term, they have, a, they have meetings with um, uh, the mm -hmm. families, they get all the families together for a community meeting. Um, and, and so there seems to be a bit of a partnership there. Um, and the, the, the Uchu parents, uh, or the Arianga parents, visit uh, Unity just a couple of times a year. And it's actually quite a lot harder for them to do that. Um, and, and I mean, even just recently, I tried to get some down for a graduation and there's a whole variety of logistical issues to be at, you know, for those families to be able to travel the 1,500 kilometres down to the South Australian school for the graduation. So, um, so, so that's probably it in a nutshell. Um, I, I suppose the, 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 the project is to tr really to try and work out, you've got two different systems, very different diverse schools, how do they work together? Two very different cultural and social systems how, how does it how does it work and h how do they form that partnership but the word partnership is used in the community and um, it's used at the school as well so well if there really is a partnership I'm just trying to work out what's behind it thanks Andrew um, I mean it raises all sorts of questions in my mind but for the purpose of this uh, this presentation I guess the, one of the things that I w I'd be asking myself well is this arrangement, if it works, let's say it works, and these four young people graduate from year 12, are they likely to go to university? Uh, so, you know, is this approach actually assisting the, the, the pipeline or the pathway into university? And perhaps more importantly for the Northern Territory, are they likely to participate in tertiary studies at either CDU or Bachelor? And I'm not quite sure, when time will tell, but I just raised some questions about that. Um, and one would think that for young people that are going interstate for their boarding, if they have a good experience, as perhaps these students are, then the chances are that they'll possibly stay interstate. And so we're taking the best and brightest kids out of communities, and not only potentially is the community missing out from uh, their, their new knowledge, their their experience being able to walk in two worlds, uh, their capacity, their, their social connections, but the Northern Territory is missing out as well. And what's more, Bachelor and CDU are missing out, um, and as are the, the students in, the, in their life and cohort. So it all sounds really nice and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what Andrew finds out about why and how this works. Uh, but the outcome to this, I think, are still uh, up for grabs. We don't really know what the impact is going to be. John, we've got about a minute to go. A minute to go? Great, okay. Um, and so one of the consequences of taking, uh, I guess, kids to complete their secondary education in another state is, I assume, that their ATARs don't come back to the Northern Territory. They're South Australian ATARs, are they? I suppose so, yeah. And so we don't see any increase in the number of uh, uh, Aboriginal students with increasing uh, ATARs above 90. Um, and some of the data I've seen uh, from the project that we did with 
the CAT and a few others last year, seem to suggest that the number of remote students attending uh, Bachelor at least uh, is declining. And maybe it's the same for CDU. And uh, perhaps importantly for those students themselves, the employment outcomes for uh, them when they get to back to community as Year 12 graduates aren't as positive as they might be for non-Indigenous students who complete Year 12 as well. So, so all round, that good news story has got some big questions about it in terms of the outcomes. So there's, uh, you know, there, there are these problems that um, arise from a strategy that's designed to improve year 12 retention through boarding, um, but uh, you know, we, we don't really know what the outcomes might be. And indeed, the outcomes for communities might actually be negative. So where does this leave us? Um, uh, I think it deals us leaving, uh, uh, dealing with systemic inequities. Uh, so the systemic inequities are uh, multi-layered uh, and they arise as a result of policies and strategies that have come from the Northern Territory Department of Education, from the Commonwealth in terms of its promotion of scholarship programs, from schools that are promoting a particular ideological uh, uh, framework. Um, and that then creates a them and us framework that instead of being both ways or comfortable in two worlds, sets up a, a, a community where some have had the, Western, uh, the best of Western education and some have had nothing. And that I think is a bit of a worry. And, uh, and it may well lead to a declining capacity in remote communities. And so, you know, the real intent, which is to actually give people an education so that they can get a job and have a fruitful career, is lost uh, for the community. Uh, and indeed, we don't know whether or not this approach is actually improving pathways into higher education, particularly for CDU and Bachelor, or not. Uh, we might assume that it is, but we don't know. And uh, we don't actually even know what the benefits are financially or emotionally or um, socially for the boarding students themselves. That work hasn't been done fully. And that leaves us with a lot more work to do, which is great for those of us who are academics. Um, um, but um, uh, it's sort of, you know, we've done all this work and we still haven't got any answers, so it seems, anyhow. Yeah.